Are you on Instagram? If so, then please give Adventure Diaries a follow. The page is at Adventure Diaries underscore underscore or simply search Adventure Diaries Chris Watson and you'll find additional podcast content and adventure content too. So go and add me now on Instagram and I'll see you over there. Thank you. I'd, I'd spent some time with the Maasai in Africa and um, I did a sort of mini expedition over a week and a half with them. And um, that, that I felt really proud about that. I had, I had an experience with them, which is something I'd been craving for a long time. And um, I, I was on my own. There was no... Um, editorial sort of uh, pressures there was no brand pressures I'd gone and done this trip for me um, to, to to go and learn and to photograph and I'd gone actually gone out there to shoot one of my friend's weddings <laughs> and the deal that we made was that um, instead of getting paid for it he was going to get me in touch with a Maasai family wow. that had connection to Maasai warriors that could I could go and trek through the savannah with them who will be willing to talk about the path of what it takes to become a Maasai warrior, that you know the sort of the masculine path, um, and some of the things that would happen with the, Ma- uh, the Maasai today, so stuff to do with land rights and things like that. And some of the photography that I came back with and the stories that I came back with there were just just reminders of like when you go and do something for yourself, like how 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 good it can be. When I was in Alaska doing the Yukon trip, we would see them swing them across the river with their heads just above the water with the, the little calves or they would we would be sitting on islands with a fire eating food for lunch and then they would just you get this big bull moose just walk out of the tundra right next to us so on that it was on that trip that I kind of fell in love with the, how just huge the animals are and how graceful the animals are it's just honestly an incredible animal and then it was about a year and a half ago, maybe a little bit longer, but I, I came across an article, it might be Nat Geo, but they were talking about the decline of this drastic decline of moose in northern Minnesota. So I, I literally took a screen capture on my phone and I wrote on my finger on the phone, you know, future project. And this again, it's just one of those serendipitous moments where you, a year and a half ago, I'm scrolling through my phone, I'm thinking of new ideas, so I'm thinking maybe we could do this, we could make a, you know, really focus on making like the first proper real documentary film about this with you know lots of really deep body of work welcome to the adventure diaries podcast where we share tales of adventure connection and exploration from the smallest of creators to the larger than life adventurers we hope their stories inspire you to go create your own extraordinary adventures and now your host chris watson Welcome to another episode of the Adventure Diaries. Today I'm joined by Ian Finch, a former Royal Marine turned expedition guide and visual storyteller. Ian has navigated some challenging and remote terrains in his time, bringing to life some really incredible stories. And today we discuss one of his more poignant journeys, the Cherokee Trail of Tears. The Trail of Tears being the forced displacement of the Cherokee Native Americans in the USA. We also discuss his journey in understanding the declining populations of moose in far northern Minnesota and the impact that that is having on the environment, species and the Native American culture. He shares tales of endurance, cultural engagement and environmental advocacy, encouraging us all to explore responsibly and support community-led conservations. Ian's journey and stories are captivating and thought-provoking, and don't be surprised if they take you down the rabbit hole after this episode. This episode is full of history, adventure, culture, and advocacy. What an episode. So settle in and enjoy this fantastic conversation with Ian Finch. Ian Finch, welcome to the Adventure Diaries. How are you? Very well, thanks. How are you? I'm great. I'm great. Thank you. And excited to to have you on the show. As I was saying just before we kind of hit record, The Last Wilderness of Scotland, your piece with uh, Jamie Barnes is in part responsible for what we're doing right now. So so thank you for that. And we'll probably touch a little bit on that as we step through. Mm-hmm. Happy to. Yeah. So Ian, as a way of framing up the conversation today, I want to really unpack your journey a little bit so how you've got into the adventure photography world uh, including some of your expedition guiding some of your writing and then really some of the expeditions two of which if we get time the Cherokee Trail of Tears 
And the recent kind of article that I picked up on Sidetrack magazine, so the Moose Tracks uh, Underwater, which I think is mm. part one of two as well. So some of the work that you've done with the indigenous tribes in North America. But maybe rolling back to start giving that a bit of context, I wanted to understand a bit more around your background and your formative years. What drew you to things as a child, the outdoors, and what kind of influences did you have that kind of in part influenced your journey? Yeah, that's a good question. I think it was, I'd never, I don't really come from an outdoorsy family in terms of like the classical sense, outdoorsy. So I didn't have a mother or father that would hike and go into the mountains or anything like that. My dad was a, a major influence in that sort of, in in some respects, the outdoor world, he would do a lot of hunting and a lot of fishing, a lot of shooting. And I'd go with him in sort of my early formative years and go fishing with him early in the morning and learn about fishing and shooting and all of these kind of things. So I could, you probably could say that was a very early exposure into dark, wet, cold mornings, sitting along on the riverbank for hours and hours on end and sitting and waiting and patient and observing nature and, and that kind of thing. So, yeah, but, but other than that, it was hiking and sort of wild camping came a lot later, really. But what I knew from early on was how to how I enjoyed using my body and and the physical aspect of what I do which led obviously then really to to the marines aspect of things but the desire to push my body from a sporting aspect from athletics or cross country and just yeah seeing really how far I could go from a physical limits perspective Uh, but when you're young you don't really you don't really understand that concept you just do it because you enjoy what you do and you're chasing something you can't really put your finger on when you're a kid there's no framework and there's no you don't understand really what's going on you're just pushing and pushing for for something yeah and it's no more complicated than that really yeah what so was it the was it like physical education or sports that you that you were drawn to then? Because obviously you touched on you became a Royal Marines commando as well, mm-hmm. so really you must have really relished in that kind of physical endurance and stuff like that. Did, did you see yourself being in that type of space as opposed to the adventure space when you were earlier? Uh, not really. It was more the fitness space. I think. Yeah. Um, when I was at school, I, I was just naturally attuned to anything physical. Um, and I love geography and I love creativity at that point. I was really sort of drawn to art and graphics. So now working in the photography world and the writing world mm. and the physical world, those kind, there's many different pieces of a jigsaw puzzle that have only just been placed together in the last sort of eight, nine years, really. But I wanted to be a sports teacher, ultimately. Yeah. Yeah. And when I realised that I maybe that I just wanted to sort of explore the world, maybe go travelling a little bit more, I put that on hold. And then that's when a friend of my dad's who is a, a Royal Marine. Yeah, well, I, I met him and he was a big inspiration for joining the Corps. And then after that, it was right, that's a big boys club. I'm going to spend a few years practicing and training really hard before I even joined. So there was a lot of stuff that I that was at school prepared me for even just joining and and sort of approaching sort of the thoughts of joining the war marines yeah how long were you in the marines for then it was just four years so i did four. just over minimum service yeah yeah and did you get did you travel much when you yeah were in yeah we did so i joined at the end of the iraq war so when i joined my commando unit there were guys that were coming back my unit 4-2 commando there was guys coming back from iraq so when they joined, we then went into sort of like a, almost like a release period where there wasn't much going on at that time. So we did Arctic winter warfare training. So we spent a lot of time up in Norway doing sort of the extreme cold weather stuff. And then we went over to train with the US Marines in jungle, oh, not sorry, jungle, so sort of more like, like tropical and riverine kind of training mm-hmm. in their swamp sort of areas on the east coast of the US. Mm-hmm. So yeah, and then I then I went down to Paul and worked in sort of in a role down in Paul. So yeah, it was an incredible few years that where you really get a crash course in manhood and who you are and teamwork, leadership, responsibility, accountability. Yeah, I wouldn't change that experience for the world. Yeah. So, so when did you pick up a camera? So the camera, so yeah, this was something that I was always, creativity is something that's always been in me. I had, again, at school and afterwards at school, it was more writing and art. I knew I loved writing, um, but the camera side of it was quite, quite a a lot further down the line I was just out taking lots of photos on my phone as most people were really I just knew that I had a a draw to landscapes mountains I was doing at that point I was doing doing a lot of wild camping a lot of trekking a lot of hiking also I had a, a, a real draw to street photography 
So I'd go around London and just take pictures of people. I know they they wouldn't know I'd be taking photos, but I'd take little cool photos. I loved the black and white contrast, the imagery. I definitely was drawn to some of the black and white stuff that was just and not antique but sort of stuff that I, I like photographers of the past that made things look old and things that were real and organic. So it was then that I picked up a, a very old Canon 550D. It was like a 200 pound camera. Then I got a, a quite a, a cheap lens for that, but it was another 200 quid lens. But it was at that stage, it was, I wasn't really sure how to use the camera. So I stayed to the security comfort of the phone. And it was only later down the line, 2015, that I, I met a photographer from Brooklyn who had seen some of the stuff that I'd been posting. And he was like, look, you've got an eye for it. But you've just got to get off of your phone. You're limiting yourself by the phone. And it was like a light, light bulb moment where someone gave me permission. And it was um, someone saying, yeah, you know what? You've got something. You're good enough. Go and explore it. Because at that point, I had no idea of what I, what I was doing was good or interesting or anything. I was just doing what came natural. Yeah, fantastic. I mean, you've done some... You've done some incredible pieces with a lot of real mainstream publications. Sidetrack magazine, of course, that we touched on there, but I think Outdoor magazine, you've done a lot of brand work for Raven and various other brands. What was your kind of breakthrough piece then? How did you get into the kind of, you know, the adventure mainstream, to, to, to put, it, uh, put it one way? Yeah, there was two, two, two kind of experiences. From a creative sort of expedition level of writing and, and the expeditions that I do with Sidetrack, in 2016, we, myself and a few friends, we canoed the Yukon, which was like 2,000 miles worth of canoeing. And the Brooklyn photographer was on that. And he was a, a photographer that I admired and I'd, I'd enjoyed his work for years. And he'd originally worked in Sidetrack. So he brought me to Sidetrack initially through his work. And I put together this trip along the Yukon and he came along and his photography work, his name is Jay Cole. She's, his work is absolutely sublime sort of photography work. As someone I look up to still for his creativity and ingenuity and everything. And that whole, that, the imagery from that trip, John Somerton, who owns Sidetracked, he picked that up through, through Jay. And then he spoke to me and he said, look, can we feature this? Can you write a sort of 10,000 word story of a certain section of the trip? And I was like, yeah, I'd love to. Writing is my first medium, really, of creativity and everything. So, yeah, it was just that was the first avenue. But the real breakthrough photography-wise for my own actual work was a very serendipitous moment where I think a lot of I'd, maybe yourself and a lot of people that might be listening to this, there's always these key serendipitous moments in your life where they there's forks and you take one fork and then your life is changed. And one of these moments was I was actually at Kendall Mountain Film Festival <laughs> And I, there was a, the original base camp, so we're talking quite a few years ago now, 2018. The original base camp was in a slightly different area, and there was yurts, these kind of yurts. Mm -hmm. And some of the brands had their yurts in this area, and Low Alpine was one of the brands. And I just so happened to be walking into one of the yurts at a specific moment during the day. And I heard out of the corner of my ear someone saying, oh, we're looking for a new creative direction, something edgy, raw, real, someone who's living that lifestyle. So to come in and I had one business card on me and I was walking around this yurt sort of in a circular direction thinking, right, have I got the confidence to sort of yeah. follow this through and speak to someone? This was the first thing I'd never done. I'd never done anything paid before. And I circled all the way back around to where this lady, Alex, her what name was. And then I just thought, right, I've got to take this chance. So I approached her and said, look, my name's Ian. I do brand photography and adventure photography and this kind of stuff. I gave her my business card. And then she said, yeah, okay, we'll have a look at the website and get back to you. And then on the Sunday night when I got home from Kendall, I stayed up to about two in the morning and put together a mood board. Mm -hmm. And then I made sure about 7 a.m. that mood board was sent on an email. So that would be the first email she received that day. And then she responded and said, look, yeah, we'll get back to you in a couple of weeks. And then two or three weeks later, I got a phone call asking whether I was available to go to Tenerife for a week to do a new sort of campaign shoot for their new rucksacks that were coming available. And everything in that moment was absolute imposter syndrome, yeah. like fierce imposter syndrome of there's no way I can pull this off. There's, I've, I've muddled my way through this to now, and, but I agreed to it. And then that really went well. And I was really happy with the content. So with the brand, and then I worked with them for a number of years and that a few sort of autumn, winter and summer campaigns set the foundation of me being able to then pitch further work. 
No, that's fantastic, Ian. It's funny, it's a, a recurring theme that comes up in these chats. It's like, some, there's that, like you say, there's that crossroads moment and it's mm. when people actually go for it and just have the confidence to kind of put themselves out there and be a bit vulnerable and they, they go for it. But then the imposter syndrome thing, again, I mean, I'm still get that at the minute, even doing this, speaking mm. to you and, like, as I said, speaking to Matt last night as well. It's amazing. Yeah. And I mean, your work is great. So it's, yeah, it's fantastic. So are you still, you're still doing work with that? brand t- today aren't you not low alpine no so oh. nowadays it's a, a couple other brands yeah like sort of sort of the, some of the big sort of oh, so that was low alpine sorry i thought that was phil Ra- for Ra- i can never say that <laughs> yeah. phil Raven. it's bad enough the scottish brogue and that so weird so weird your expedition skills and all the stuff that goes into that because you've been in some very extreme hostile remote environments so is that Building up those skills along with the photography and stuff, there must be a lot that goes into the planning and the logistics of all of that. Where have you, the skills that come from all of that, is that from like the commando uh, skill set or is this just things that you've layered on over over spending time in the wild? I would say that's like a, there's an intertwining ribbon of both those things you've just mentioned. In, in, in the Marines, you the kind of the visceral the soldiering skills but the what that gave me of being going through that process mentally physically and being quite an organized person as i am anyway that you can put together expeditions and trips in very sort of slow methodical process of just planning certain aspects of the trip and really working hard to make sure that they're, they're wired tight but that being in the raw marines it's have things wired tight in the marines so when you if you, if you was actually to go on operations or when you're going through your training or when you're in a commando unit, everything's, yeah, it's got to be super wide tight. So there's a lot of preparation involved and there's a lot of looking at different angles, different perspectives, um, bringing in different voices, different opinions, all that kind of thing. So when you come out of the forces and then you start thinking about bigger trips and expeditions, this is why military personnel tend to do well in the expedition world because the difference sort of methodically is not that big it's all about food water survival it's all about planning safety all of those kind of components you just remove the soldiering element so when i came out of the forces it lent to being in the expedition world and me trying to sort of cross the apex of my creativity and my love for culture and people and landscape it was finding a way to bring all of those together that that was the the tougher part i think yeah, and, and bringing teams together, no doubt as well, and picking yeah. the, the right members of those teams and, and teamwork and stuff. So, 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 how did your relationship with Jamie Barnes c- come to be? Because it looks like you've done a few expeditions, haven't you? you the, the wilderness, last wilderness of Scotland, and the one in sidetracked as well. Yeah, so I, when I was training for the Yukon, I was training. I was doing some paddling skills on a, a reservoir system not far from where he lived, and the algorithm must have got sort of again pulled people together and he I was putting some posts up about what I was doing and he saw the post and then we followed each other then met up with each other went hiking went camping he was a filmmaker as well yeah. um and a photographer so yeah and we just hit it off he just very he's a fair bit younger than I'm he's about 15 years younger than I am so there's, there's a big generational gap there but we're very much on the same level of wanting to tell good stories great stories trying to tell them in an authentic way so we just mm-hmm. met in the middle with that and yeah we're, we're still really good friends yeah, yeah. excellent yeah. So, so that's a perfect uh bridge into some of those expeditions so there is a, th- a theme in some of the, the well today's conversation about the the cherokee trail of tears and the moose tracks underwater north american led expeditions with that and an angle around the indigenous Native Americans. What's drawn you to that? Because there seems to be a bit of a theme with the interest in their culture, and I just wanted mm. to understand that. Yeah, I mean, it's one of those things, again, that it's quite difficult to explain why you like something. It just, I think, I definitely, again, think it comes down to the relationship growing up with my dad. He was very much into history, archaeology, ancient cultures, ancient mythology, and all, all sort of that, that sphere of history and people. I mean, he's very knowledgeable in that area as well. And we used to have a, a family cabinet and shelves at home where I grew up. And in that was Native American arrowhead, books about archaeology, ancient Egypt, the mysteries of Egypt, all of this absolutely enticing stuff of like a young man loves that kind of thing. 
And I came across a book by a, a guy called Edward Curtis, who was the last um, guy to photograph all of the Native American tribes as they were in the early 20s. And he uh, photographed them with this plate photography. And he, he, I mean, there's like 25, 30 volumes of this book from the 20s. So the book itself is called, the, I think it's called The Native American or The Native Indian or something along those lines. But absolutely insane book of incredible photography. And all he uses is a plate glass camera and these kind of cloths where he cut holes in his cloths to let certain amounts of light in. And then he positioned the people in their regalia within these little setups he used to put together. And then he travelled over the North American continent photographing all these tribes. So on reading this book, I just fell in love with, I think, ultimately, the connection to nature, the perspectives on nature, music, storytelling, all of those things. So a lot of the stuff nowadays that I've done from the Yukon to the Maasai in Africa to the Cherokee and Indonesia and stuff... It all revolves around the, the people's connection to nature and what is happening to nature with from a cultural perspective and an environmental perspective, that kind of that meeting point of of those perspectives and those stories. Yeah. Are, are you drawn more to the cultural side and the people side than you are the landscapes? Did you say? Oof, that's a difficult question. I, I would say the people side, probably 60, 40, but they're both one of the same. The yeah. people and the land are in these cultures very much intertwined. So when you go to speak to these people and learn um, about perspectives that they have, about where things are at the moment in the world, it all goes back to the land and their relationship to the land. So mm. now in my world of guiding and stuff like that and guiding people, there's a huge desire to share knowledge of how nature works to so people understand and care about how the world not the world sorry but nature works yeah. we'll be back after a quick break are you on instagram if so then please give adventure diaries a follow the page is at adventure diaries underscore underscore or simply search adventure diaries chris watson and you'll find additional podcast content and adventure content too. So go and add me now on Instagram and I'll see you over there. Thank you. Yeah, the more we can do for environmentalism as well, the better. Yeah. Uh, fantastic. So so touching then on, like I say, the two expeditions that, are, that kind of piqued, piqued my interest, so the Cherokee Trail of Tears, the kind of story of the, the Cherokee people being forcibly removed from the land. A tragedy. I think about a quarter of the, the people perished, didn't they, on that journey? So, yeah. How does a white British man <laughs> engage with the, the Native Americans straddling sensitivities and yeah. colonialism and everything that goes with it? How does yeah. how did that come to be? I mean, yeah, I mean... How did you manage to engage and get the trust of these people, Ian? Yeah, I mean, it took about a year and a half of emailing the Cherokee Nation, which is one of the larger native nations in the US. And we had, a, I managed to grab a couple of contacts that took months and months to really sort of get into in some of the inboxes and speak to people. And because really what, what I thought would be the best thing to do is like to get permission first, like to show sort mm. of the ultimate sort of level of respect is get permission to do this. Because as you said, two white European guys, walking a native trail and telling a native story, there is some like incredibly sensitive sort of perspectives around that. So we sent a lot of work that we'd done, especially from the Yukon. I sent, I sent some videos and stuff that we had interviewed people. And we said, this is really where we'd like to go with this. And from a perspective of respect, we would love to engage with the Cherokee Nation along the route and then finish the route, which was about 13, 1400 miles worth of canoeing and walking with Cherokee people and then interview some of the Cherokee Nation at the end. So, yeah, it was quite difficult. But once I think once we we showed sort of how we were going to approach it, the kind of the sensitivity of how we were going to approach it and the time spent um, building a rapport with the nation. And we spoke, I mean, in the end, we spoke to the chief, the Cherokee chief. So that was incredible. So, yeah, you just I think you've a lot of the times when in this story in, in particular, when you go to speak to some of these people, when you're willing to share a story authentically and honestly and show that you care, that is where the bridge can be crossed. And it was crossed, I think, just taking your time. And But it's something that we found on every project I've worked on, that this is a very sensitive and careful bridge that you need to cross with a lot of respect to, with who you're working with. 
Yeah, and I think your portfolio is showing that through the authenticity of it. You're not out looking for sound bites or clickbait or just any old story. As it does, it does it, it does it justice. It's fantastic. How did you deal with that emotionally, well, physically? Because it must have been a huge undertaking. Twelve hundred miles. Was it half half paddling, half walking? Uh, three quarters yeah. paddling. So it was about a thousand miles worth of paddling and about four hundred miles worth of walking across one mountain range and yeah. a very long road stretch. Yeah, yeah. emotional <laughs> yeah. road stretch. <laughs> was I mean thinking about the stories about what happened to to, to the Cherokee as a tragedy? Was that emotional at all to to deal with when you were speaking to the chief or any of the Cherokee? Yeah. Yeah, it was definitely because we really we we didn't really get to sit and talk with members of the Cherokee Nation really uh, uh, only until towards the end because we were so far east in the Great Smoky Mountains that there wasn't the certain band of Cherokee that we were associating ourselves with mm-hmm. at that point. So yeah, it was when we got to the end we actually we interviewed and sat with some Cherokee what they call them national treasures, which are people mm-hmm. that are holding certain aspects of the Cherokee culture, and we stayed at the Cherokee Heritage Centre for. I think over a week at the end, and then with a Cherokee family who we're still friends with. And we spoke to two brothers uh, who were the two brothers that walked with us the final six miles. And we talked about sort of issues that are sort of that are becoming young men in a native from a native nation in the US, some of the things that they're both doing to sustain the culture. Mm. And we went to powwows and all different types of stuff. So yeah, it was a very special experience. And a lot of the time you your input is limited all you can simply do is ask questions and listen that's what we found to be the most sort of like powerful thing to do yeah do you know how they've received the piece on that whether it was received well respectfully or otherwise yeah so it took obviously another year for the article to come out which was then it was, I think it was 20 pages. I think it was one of the biggest pieces in sidetrack to that yeah. up to, date, to that point. And then we, when it got printed, we sent it to the family who we spent a lot of time with there. And then they then sent this one of the National Treasures, a lady called Tonya Weaver. And she's one of the native dressmakers for the Cherokee, and she upholds the traditions of the native dressmaking. So she's very well known in the Cherokee Nation. And, yeah, she sent me this beautiful card back, this illustrated card saying how important it was that we told the story. And I've actually got that on my windowsill that I every few days I look at it and I'm like, this is why I do what I do. This is why I do what I do yeah. like, for this reason. Um, that You can't really truly tell the whole story. You, you can't even understand the magnitude of pain mm-hmm. and the sort of historical trauma that the Cherokee have been through. But we can share um, a story as authentically as we can in this yeah. way. What was it? What was it like being at the kind of ceremonies and the powwows and stuff? That must have been pretty, pretty amazing. Yeah, I mean, I've got an absolute affinity with native music, American music or Aboriginal music, and I studied sound engineering as well. So when just after I left school, so I have a real sort of draw to sort of music and rhythm and voices, native voices as well. So yeah, to go to the powwow where you're in, and it's it, you're in a stadium kind of thing so where they're all doing the power and they're all dancing and they're all being judged on how good their dancing is mm-hmm. and the music and the dramas. I mean, it is spine tingling how interesting it to, is to watch and to listen to to, to those people because you can really imagine what that would have been like originally out on, on the grounds of the Cherokee sort of back in the day. But yeah, it was a, a, a very, we were honoured to be there. That was the yeah. most important thing. Yeah, fantastic. Yeah, so can I... Any lessons that you took from that? Anything, any perspectives, new perspectives? Ooh, that's a good question. How much I don't like walking long distances on roads. <laughs> well, considering you must have walked that in the best of the new gear, imagine what these people must have endured. Yeah, all yeah, well, ago. yeah. The church you walked back in the dead of winter. Oh, yeah, Christ. so. This was like 1830 something, wasn't it? Yeah, 1838. Christ. Yeah. But they walked back in winter. Women were pregnant elderly women elderly men and if they passed away they were left on the side of the road kind of thing which is horrific Mm -hmm. so yeah we did it in summer high summer so the heat was pretty bad but some of the things some of the things i learned were more slightly of just the sort of the pain and suffering of what happened but also like the pride of the in the the sustaining of the the cultures Mm -hmm. 
that there's just such a pri- depth of pride in who the Cherokee are. And that was just so important. And then from the expedition side, there was a couple of dicey moments where we nearly drowned and tornado stuff that went on. Right. I mean, uh-huh. I could talk for hours about all this kind of thing. But yeah, it's we learned a lot from that trip. I learned a lot from that trip in decision making as well, in the importance of making good decisions. Yeah, because because this is down in it's like Oklahoma area, isn't, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, so we started in the Smokies, so in, yeah. in Austin in the east, and then it went all the way up through Tennessee, Kentucky, Alabama, and then in yeah, then into Oklahoma. Finished in Oklahoma. Uh, were you paddling in any of those hurricanes or anything? Not in the hurricane, no. They're no. tornadoes there, so oh, it was tornado. tornado. Sorry. Yeah, so it was. Yeah, we, we there was a couple of times when we had to go up the river because of tornado warnings, and we had t- tornado stuff on our phone, and there was a couple of times that were were pretty close to stuff yeah. happening. But yeah, you live and learn, and you just mitigate those risks as best as you can, and then yeah. you just keep pushing on. Do you have any wildlife encounters when you you were out there? Yeah. Do you know what? In the, only really in the early stages, so there was lots of like wild boar and black bear up in the Smokies. They were coming out of coming up hibernation lots and lots of like snakes and stuff when you get into sort of kentucky and alabama there's lots of snakes and big spiders and armadillos and yeah all just minutia like small stuff mm. and then probably the one of the most psychologically damning one was monster ticks really oh really oh wow yeah yeah and we're talking oh. squadrons and thousands and millions of them just all over yeah. us yeah it's horrible yeah well on that actually Probably a perfect bridge again into your other expedition, uh, Moose Tracks Underwater. So again, working with, was it Seth Moore, I think the biologist for the Grand Portage Band of the Chippewa, another Native American group. I think in that, there was a a point about, I think, the decline of them. So do you want to give us a quick intro, Ian, in terms of what that expedition was about? And then I'll ask my questions because people listening are probably wondering what I'm talking about. So what was your expedition about the Grand Portage Band of the Chippewa and tracking the moose in Ontario? Yeah, so I think it's good to mention that where, why moose? I think it's um, an important sort of uh, starting point. And it was when I was in Alaska doing the Yukon trip, we would see them swing them across the river with their heads just above the water with the, the little calves or they would we would be sitting on islands with a fire eating food for lunch and then they would just you get this big bull moose just walk out of the tundra um right next to us so on that it was on that trip that i fell in love with the, how just huge the animals are and how graceful the animals are it's just honestly an incredible animal and then it was about a year and a half ago may, maybe a little bit longer but I, I came across an article, it might be Nat Geo, but they were talking about the decline of this drastic decline of moose in northern Minnesota. So I, I literally took a screen capture on my phone and I wrote on my finger on the phone, future project. Um, and this, again, it's just one of those serendipitous moments where you, you, a year and a half ago, I'm scrolling through my phone. I'm thinking of new ideas. I'm thinking like two years mm-hmm. ahead. And then I just thought maybe we could do this. We could make a really focus on making a, like a first proper real documentary film about this with a lots of a really deep body of work of photography and writing and make it a multi-year project rather than just like a singular expedition. So then I just decided to put in, put in some time on the research and contacting biologists, contacting epidemiologists, wildlife biologists all over the uh, northern Minnesota and southern Canada that were specifically involved with moose research. And again, it was just one of these things where you've just got to put in the time and send multiple emails and almost annoy these people into <laughs> replying um, because they're very busy people. And one guy kept popping up, one lead biologist called Seth Moore, who's the lead moose biologist. His name kept popping up and I saw a couple of documentaries, very short documentaries where he participated in them. And his insights were just incredible. So I got managed to get his email from another biologist and then sending him lots of emails saying this is the idea this is the project this is what we've done before we would love to come out and 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 do a multi-year filming of photography and writing about this subject and he found so we basically had myself jamie barnes we had the the chap a a french quebec guy called martin who i canoed the yukon with we had all three of us locked in flights booked this whole thing ready to go and the the concept that i had was to paddle with a a fourth person who was either a native person from um, the Ojibwe who lived in that area Mm -hmm. or a biologist who was a moose biologist. 
And then I came to the idea of like maybe the biologist would might have been the best sort of the, the best idea at that point for the canoeing. And Seth had canoed before. He knew the landscape that we were going into. He was a kind of the person that was going to on the trip in, tell us about the environment of the moose, where the moose was, and, and and sort of be this anchor for the whole story for the actual canoe section that we did in southern Ontario. So a month before the trip actually was due to start, we had no one other than us three. Um, and then luckily Seth came through. We had a Zoom call and he agreed to do it. Mm -hmm. So then we all flew out to southern Ontario um, in late August going into September and we paddled across a, a, a massive swath of national park in Southern Ontario that kind of just yeah. north of the border to Minnesota where this actual issue is taking place. Um, and we, yeah, we spent 10 days canoeing and then we, once we finished canoeing, we then went down into um, the U S and went into the grand portage area. So we went into the reservation mm -hmm. And interviewed a few people there, some people sort of actual native biologists that are associated with the band. So to give you some context, Seth is actually employed by the government, who's then sort of almost like subcontracted into the, the actual tribe itself to find out what the hell is going on mm. and to sustain the moose or, or bring the moose numbers up so that the band can con continue their subsistence hunting. So there was this beautiful sort of environmental story, cultural story that really anchored in the middle. And yeah, we're still learning now, after one and a half years down the line. Yeah. We're still learning. This is a multi, like you say, it's a multi year project, isn't it? Yeah, so one and a half years. Yeah. And so part, of, so yeah, you've touched on so environmentalism, <laughs> adventure, and, and, and that stuff that goes, that comes with that naturally. But I think the point is that the ancestral right to hunt, isn't it? But the, yeah. But the moose numbers are declining significantly. And I think if I recall, warmer climates resulting in deer travelling further north, wolves following them, eating not just the deer, but the moose calves and, and stuff, and, and therefore the, nice. the numbers were declining. But you, I think when you mentioned ticks earlier, I'm sure you said something, I think, in, in the article, that they're dying of like tick infestation and disease as well. Yeah, so. yeah that's correct. So there's, there's this meeting point of all of these factors that mm -hmm. are causing the moose to decline. The ticks is one, the winter ticks. So the ticks, now the, the winters in this specific area are war or becoming warmer and arriving later, leaving earlier. The ticks are surviving the winter. So they're coming back in doubling and tripling each season. And then the deer that are coming further north because of the warmer winters, they're bringing a brain worm with them. And then the, with that, the wolves are following the deer and then the deer, sorry, the wolves are then seeing the calves of the moose as the easier pickings. Mm. So they're picking off the calves. So this warming climate in that area is then bringing in all these other factors that are affecting the moose. So, yeah, it's a pretty important issue and it all revolves around the warming sort of the warming climate in that area, especially yeah. in the winters. What's the kind of summation so far in terms of like the, the are the moose actually declining or, or are they migrating elsewhere? Do, do, do you know yet? Yeah, so I think that what we're understanding is they are on the decline, on a massive yeah. decline, especially in the last decade or the last fifteen years. Mm -hmm. They will naturally move more north into sort of the warmer, or sorry, into the colder, colder. territories and colder areas, and especially in the winter. But yeah, to see some of the things, the imagery we saw of some of the moose that had ticks on them. On the image I saw, I had a, a moose's head had a hundred or an estimated a hundred thousand ticks on it. Oh, and then this brain worm sends them into this kind of paralysis and disorientation. And then they walk out to the roads and get run over. And hmm. so it's an incredibly important issue. And it's, uh, and the moose isn't uh, at this moment class as an endangered species, just, hmm. a, just a species of concern. So that may change if, if nothing happens. But there's a lot of good things happening. The research that's being done by Seth and lots of many other biologists, they're, they're putting some incredible stuff in place and some of the data that's coming out of it is incredible. Yeah. Fantastic. Do you, do you think that's maybe where your, your career trajectory might go? So mixing more science and environmentalism as well as the cultural side? Is that something you'd like to do more of? Yeah, I think I've enjoyed I've done a little bit in front of camera as well, which <laughs> I've, I've always been more comfortable behind camera. So in front of camera, I've done a little bit there, which is good. I'd like to maybe pursue that a little bit more in, in, yeah. in that realm. But yeah, it's people, landscape, culture, the climate and everything like that plays a role in every one of those 
sort of those facets so anywhere you go in any sort of expedition that you go on or any culture that you talk to in some of these remote places where people are intrinsically linked to the landscape and then the changing landscape mm. because of the environment mm. this is this topic's going to come up again and again and it's yeah it's mm. something that i think will naturally be part of a lot of the stuff that i do yeah what time of year were you over there in uh, so we was there late August last year and then in February this year. So we was over there for a couple of weeks in February right. this year. So we did a lot of some of the winter work, which is aerial surveys mm -hmm. where they fly with biologists. They basically track the moose mm -hmm. and then sedate the moose from helicopters okay. with these kind of aerial darts. Yeah. And then they land the helicopters wherever it is um, and then track the moose down and then take blood samples, ear samples, count some ticks in a certain sort of space on the on, on the animal. And they do all manner of like tests and then they they get, give the the moose almost like an anti sedative mm -hmm. that then wakes the moose up in like 10 15 minutes and then they watch the moose leave and then they board the helicopter again and then by that time there's a spotter plane that spotted another moose and then they go on to that moose so mm -hmm. we filmed the whole process mm -hmm. did quite a few interviews with moose biologists um, and then we're back in September as well. So we're going back for a third mm -hmm. time and maybe even a fourth time. But there's like many tentacles that keep opening mm -hmm. up and we want to make sure we cover all the ground um, yeah. when we make this documentary and make sure all the voices are heard and all the people are, are the people represented correctly from the biologists to the, some of the native people. Fantastic. Equally, they're important. Yeah. Yeah. Is it going to be a motion feature or is it just all photography? Just styles? a doc, probably 45 yeah. minute doc. Um, because it's, it's a North American cross canadian kind of subject matter mm -hmm. it will probably be won't be we'll probably show it in the uk and stuff but it'll be more like yeah. some of the american bigger festivals fantastic <laughs> it's exciting yeah, yeah. Exciting. yeah. At the same time. yeah it's brilliant it's brilliant is this your purpose what you're doing now yeah yeah i think it's like it's taken a long time to get here i'm 45 now and the, the real first thing that I did 2016, the Yukon, it's a long time ago now. So it, my love for teaching, the outdoors, nature, all of those things, expedition, storytelling, they're all meeting at the top of this apex now where I just don't think I could really be doing anything else. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. Again, you keep teeing these up. Perfect. Ian, so your company, Walk Wild as well. So do you want to talk mm. us through that and what you're doing there? Yeah. So I was born in, when I was out actually in Alaska and coming towards the end of that trip, I was really interested in bringing how I'd felt, what I'd experienced, wildness, knowledge, knowledge of nature into ways that I could teach. So again, this is going back to that teacher that that nucleus of something that I had years ago of wanting to be a teacher now is being brought into the present. Yeah, so that business I started sort of late 2017. And that initially started with taking people on guided walks in and around London. Mm -hmm. In someone sort of like the wilder woodlands, because I absolutely love woodlands and forests and the way they work and some of the intricate sort of details of forests and nature and everything along those lines. So, and then it went from there where people are asking, can you teach like navigation and along, everything along those lines? And I was like, yeah, I'd love to do that. And now we do many different levels of navigation and also natural navigation. So how to navigate using the sun, wind, trees, plants, nature as a whole. And then weekends. So we do weekends in the Peak District, Wales, Cotswolds, North Norfolk. And every sort of everything that I do has this um, perspective of the passage of knowledge in some way. So some of the big expeditions I've been on where people shared stuff with me, I've taken that through my life and shared that then in the walks and on the trip and stuff like that and again it's all about helping people sort of explore nature in a really safe way but pushing but not pushing too hard so we're not talking about high above the tree line or the summits and things like that it's more about doing cool things in a cool way but teaching them something that they can take away and then sowing the seeds for someone to to take forth into their own lives really yeah but it's like kind of nurturing adventure and you don't need it uh, from looking at the, what you what you're offering it's not like you need weeks and months in the yukon it could be a, a weekend adventure or an afternoon or a day somewhere so i would encourage people to go and check that out fantastic yeah yeah absolutely and i mean even you can get that kind of wild experience just going to a body for the weekend and, mm. and scotland or something along those lines so yeah, exactly. I think, as I said at the start, we haven't spoken to 
many people in this now and asking for recommendations, call to adventures, all that kind of good stuff. But, you know, when theme comes up that you don't need to go that far to have these kind of wild experiences. It's great to go on expeditions and larger adventures, but there's a lot that can be said for some of our local landscapes within the UK. Yeah, 100%. And I think I think what makes it different nowadays is if you can put yourself into one of those wild environments in the UK, but I think the desensitization of taking away your phone and being and, and making it a weekend where it's just about you and your friends or your family, even your children and stuff like that, where you're immersing yourself into an environment, especially wild camping or a body experience or something like that, where you happen to get from A to B and then you happen to put up your tent and you happen to cook your food and then move on the next day to another location on foot and then another way and then map reading and all of that kind of thing, making something where you're much more present. Mm -hmm. in in the environment and i've said that a thousand times when you're taking photos or there's this creative element to what you're doing you can create put this glass um plane of glass between you and the world and the the experience and sometimes photography and that kind of thing can do that so sometimes it's all about lowering that plane of glass so you're actually present and i think adventure is 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 brilliant present yeah. In wherever you are, I think. Yeah, exactly. It is, a, it is a fine balance, that, isn't it? Trying to sometimes capture and tell a story, but experience it and, and disconnect. Yeah, it's something I struggle with sometimes and it's because, because it's almost an affliction to get the camera mm-hmm. out <laughs> at mm-hmm. times and you need to remind yourself why you're in the place in the first place. What are you most proud of your work to date? What stands out? As in photography or just adventure and your expeditions and your yes yeah, yeah. on your journey what stands out that's a that's a good question i think last year in june last year i'd, I'd spent some time with the maasai in africa and i did a sort of mini expedition over a week and a half with them and that that i felt really proud about that i had an experience with them which is something i'd been craving for a long time and i was on my own there was no editorial sort of pressures there was no brand pressures i'd gone and done this trip for me to go and learn and to photograph and i'd gone actually gone out there to shoot one of my friend's weddings and the deal that we made was that instead of getting paid for it he was going to get me in touch with a Maasai family wow. that had connection to Maasai warriors that could, I could go and trek through the savannah with them who will be willing to talk about the path of, of what it takes to become a Maasai warrior, the, the sort of the masculine path and some of the things that would happen with the, Ma- uh, the Maasai today. So stuff to land rights and things like that. And some of the photography that I came back with and the stories that I came back with there were just just reminders of like when you go and do something for yourself, like how good it can be and how it's just so interesting to go and live with people that have different perspectives when you go traveling and how to sit and listen to people that live in far away places, super far away places, how their perspectives, you can absorb those perspectives mm-hmm. and bring those perspectives back and, and employ them into your own life. And we're talking about guys in the, the Savannah out in Africa, having the same, it took me and him, the guy that I was with, we were both, we were both warriors. He still is a warrior. And I was once a warrior in, in or he, he considered it in, in to be a warrior in the armed forces, in the Marines. So it's a very interesting perspective of two men considered to be that, but having very different outlooks of what it means. That's fantastic. Did you have a kind of fire on the savannah at night? Yeah. Yeah, yeah we had to because of the, some of the lions and, mm-hmm. and stuff like that that were in the area. Yeah. So yeah, that's in that was in sidetracked one of the like, the most recent issues, I think. But yeah, just an incredible experience. Um which taught me a lot about observation, about mm-hmm. to sit and listen and watch. And I just got some crazy stories about that whole trip. I mean, it's, I could go on for another hour talking about it. Uh, well, maybe as a follow up, then we maybe can, another but, time. Yeah, we can circle back around your documentary on Ontario and stuff, and maybe to circle back to the Maasai. Uh, yeah, fantastic. Mindful of time, we're almost uh, coming up on time, and I know you've got some priorities tonight as well. So. Two kind of closing traditions on the show, one of which is a call to adventure and the other is a recommendation to pay it forward, a suggestion for a worthy cause, a charity or or, uh, something important to you. But starting with the call to adventure, what would you say is a call to adventure for anyone listening or watching? A call to adventure. 
I think I've touched on it earlier about the adventure doesn't need to be grand. It doesn't have to be over months and it doesn't have to be over weeks. I think it's all about immersion. I think it's about going into an environment that maybe you don't know so much about, something where you can go and you can learn. And it could be the Lake District, could be the Peak District, could be the wilds of the West Highlands and stuff like that, or, or a foreign country. But just go into a place where you can maybe spend a few days out in the wilderness or out in the countryside or wherever it may be and aiming to making the kind of the concept of that experience about trying to keep your phone away from the experience unless you need it for navigation or you want to get an epic sunset or see something but to just with the goal of being as as present as you can and i think that if we could do that like once every month once every three months, six months, from a mental health perspective and from a stress perspective, I think it could really help. And you can, and you generate some of your greatest ideas when you're out walking or camping or some of those things because of the lack of external stimulation. When you go outdoors, you are allowing stuff to come in rather than being blocked by everything else. So, yeah, I would say that for sure. Fantastic. Uh, yep, yeah, I agree wholeheartedly. Excellent. And finally, a paid forward suggestion. I think I, I like a lot of stuff that people are doing out there. The, the BMC are doing incredible things. But one of the, I think one of the things is true to my heart, other than the Royal Marines Association, that helping veterans and ex-Royal Marines dealing with the mental health issues and stuff like that. But one of my friends, a guy called Andy Jones, he passed away recently. He was an ex-Army guy and he died of a brain tumour. Mm. So I think the, sort of the brain tumour societies and anyone that can offer any sort of help or money into the development of research into brain tumours, I think, would be a wonderful thing. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Wonderful. And that's us at the end to thank you. This has been uh, fantastic. Uh, I love following your work uh, and your articles and sidetrack are uh, phenomenal. You've got way with words as well, even though you're, you're a fantastic photographer, but you do have a, a way with a pen or the type as well. Uh, and I thank you for that. Yeah, my pleasure. Uh, where can listeners and viewers find out more about Ian Finch? So on Instagram, it's at Ian E. Finch with the letter E in the middle there. And then, yeah, the same thing for my website, which is ianefinch.com. And then my outdoor website, which is where we run the walks and trips and navigation workshops. That's walkwild.co.uk. So, yeah, I'd love to meet anybody there. Say hello if anybody swings by. Excellent. Okay, and I'll get all that listed and then when this goes live, we'll get it tagged and get all those, uh, get your Instagram and your walk world tagged as well. Excellent. Yeah, that'll be wonderful. Thank you. Yeah, thanks Ian. Right. And Cheers I'll... mate, take care. Thanks for tuning in to today's episode. For the show notes and further information, please visit adventurediaries.com slash podcast. And finally, we hope to have inspired you to take action and plan your next adventure, big or small. Because sometimes we all need a little adventure to cleanse that bitter taste of life from the soul. Until next time, have fun and keep paying it forward. Are you on Instagram? If so, then please give Adventure Diaries a follow. The page is at Adventure Diaries underscore underscore or simply search Adventure Diaries Chris Watson and you'll find additional podcast content and adventure content too. So go and add me now on Instagram, and I'll see you over there. Thank you.